it's 11.20. And if you're on uh, this screen right now, you're in the right place if you want to hear about the assessment and treatment of mental illness and people with dementia. Uh, today, we're lucky to have with us Suzanne Lawson, who has 20 years of experience, uh, even more, in this field. And she's very knowledgeable about this. I think this is an interesting problem that uh, doesn't affect everyone, obviously, but it does affect a significant amount of the population. So Suzanne is going to go f go ahead and uh, make her presentation. So um, without further ado, I, and again, I'm Stuart Tenor. I'm on the NAMI Maryland Board of Directors, have been for four years, um, and uh, like facilitating these types of workshops because this conference has an amazing amount of information for all the people that uh, are tuning in. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Suzanne. Okay. Thank you so much, Stuart. Um, it is a real honor and pleasure to be here with NAMI. I am a huge mental health advocate, and I'll tell you a little background about background about myself and occupational therapy, and then we'll get into the slides. So I have been working as an OT for 24 years. I've worked in both subacute rehab and acute rehab, as well as acute psych psychiatric units. And um, now I work on the brain health units, been working for 24 years as an OT. And um, that's basically it for me. Um, today's topic is assessment and treatment of mental illness with people with dementia. Next slide, please. Okay, so a day in the life of an OT on the brain health units. So um, when I began at Levendale, um, which is a geriatric hospital, the, um, the brain health units were called psych units, then they were called behavioral health units, and now they're brain health units. And we have predominantly really grown from starting with people with mental illness um, in geriatrics age 55 and older to mostly, I'd say about 95% of our patients have dementia, different stages of dementia. Some have mental illness, and some have both. So what we really needed to find out was how do we work with people at different stages of dementia? And um, how do we work specifically with their mental health issues? Next slide, please. So today I will begin with speaking about the different assessments that occupational therapists use, and then we will get to treatment for specific mental health issues and some more strategies in how to treat. Um, I would say this session is both for professionals working with patients, as well as caregivers and families. So to give a little background about occupational therapists, um, OT actually started in psych with World War II veterans, helping them when they're coming back from war with illness and injury to maximize quality of life through meaningful and engaging activities. Occupational therapists um, work with function. We don't want to maximize quality of life. And we look into different categories of function. Um, typical occupational therapists work with um, you know, physical disabilities, which would be range of motion, strengthening for the upper extremities, um, ADLs, activities of daily living and self-care, anything from specifically um, uh, working with light ADLs like um, um, grooming, feeding, to bathing, dressing, to toilet transfers, shower transfers, to more higher functioning skills like um, cooking, cleaning, medication management, and financial management. And then the other parts, psychological, 
we work on four main um, different categories, but the four main ones are essentially um, stress management, coping skills, frustration tolerance, and impulse control. And then cognitively, we work on anywhere from orientation, following instructions, problem solving. So the, it's, it's really the whole combination working on that whole person. So this slide shows some different psychological assessments that we use, um, starting with the occupational therapy evaluation. And I just mentioned the four main points that we look at. Then there's a social adjustment section of the uh, independent living scale, which I actually talk about on the next slide. But the social adjustment section has different mental health statements, such as, I look forward to tomorrow. Um, I feel I would be missed if I wasn't around anymore. So, and then the, the person would say whether they agree, partially agree, or disagree. Okay, it really gives some good background information about how that person is feeling about their mental health. Um, and then there's the geriatric depression scale, which is used worldwide. Um, pretty easy to get if you go on Google, it's right there with yes and no questions. Next slide, please. Okay, so I had mentioned the home safety assessments. On the bottom left, you'll see the ILS. I also have that here with me. And it has five different sections. It's again, the independent living scale. And these are done in the hospital prior to someone going home. So we can plan specifically for those people who are living alone um, or live with family, live in the community, even in an ALF, assisted living facility. But they do um, have certain responsibilities where they take care of themselves. So specifically for the ILS, um, you know, we mentioned the social adjustment section already. The other sections are memory and orientation, which asks different cognitive, you know, um, immediate recall, short-term recall after five minutes, short-term recall after 10 minutes, because as we know, people with dementia their long-term memory tends to be much stronger than the short-term memory. That's where we see impairment. And the other sections are home management and health and safety. There's also a financial management section for those people who are responsible for their own finances. Um, and it really has lots of math questions. Um, anything from you know, keeping um, a uh, checkbook using subtraction percentiles. Um, I'll give you an example of some questions that oftentimes are challenging for people with, um, specifically that con they have maybe more concrete thinking than abstract thinking. And this is a question like, what are two precautions you can take when going out at night? And they may tell me, I don't go out at night. And, but I need an answer to this question in order to score, you know, get a correct score. So I'll say, well, what if it was an emergency and you had to go out at night? And they may still say, I don't, I don't go out at night. I'll say, well, what if someone you know is going out at night? What are two precautions they can take? So really, really trying to work on an answer and, but again, they will have difficulty with that. Um, by the way, the ILS also has, you know, um, an opportunity for partial correct answers. And they don't, I tell them they don't have to get everything correct to still do okay, because it has basically an average score. You can score in the low range, average range, or high range. Um, another question is, Suppose a person got into a cab and said, take me to my daughter-in-law's. What's the problem with that request? So we know immediately they didn't provide an address. Um, I'll, I'll see often the, my patients um, perseverate to the previous question. 
So they're not even answering that question. Or they may say, oh, oh, that's nice, but, but they're going to see family. Or, oh, well, um, they may, need to make sure they have enough money to pay the taxi. But mm -hmm. these are incorrect. It's, it's not answering the question. Also on my list is the Texas Functional Living Scale, which is in the middle on the slide. That is a wonderful home safety assessment because it has a real large cognitive aspect. Um, also listed um, is home safety cards, which is on the right on that slide. This is real simple. They're um, different pictures of home situations and the person's instructed to um, identify safe and unsafe um, safety hazards. So one picture is a woman who um, is about to sit on her couch with the crochet needle sticking up. And that you know, is obviously going to hurt when she sits. There's a picture of a young girl with marbles in front of her, small pieces and no one supervising also unsafe. So um, those are some examples. And you could really, you know, if I give them 15 cards, then I could get a percentage of which ones they get correct. Also, sometimes they'll guess and get it correct. But so I always ask them for, well, for what reason do you think this is safe? For what reason do you think this is unsafe? To make sure they have the rationale and understand it. Um, the MOCA and slums are also excellent um, cognitive as well as safety assessments, which are widely used. Next slide, please. Okay, so as for cognitive assessments, you see pictured here, these are Allen cognitive assessments. Claudia Allen is one of the founders of occupational therapy and specifically starting with the Allen Cognitive Leather Lacing Screen or ACLS, that's on my bottom left there. It's um, a piece of leather. And the instructions are to, I will demonstrate two of the um, stitches and then have them do them one at a time. And the third stitch, I ask them, see if you can do this stitch then if you have trouble, I'll show you. And what's amazing about these stitches is it gives a really um, valid, it has validity and reliability as well. It gives a really good picture of where that person's current cognitive level is and what we're working with. Um, as for the ACL also, there's a very good, if you Google um, Allen Cognitive Leather, there's an excellent YouTube video of two graduate school um, occupational therapists doing the whole ACL. So you can see that as well. The bottom right is the ADM or the Allen Diagnostic Module. And as you see, it's a placemat pattern. So what we do is show them, here's a placemat pattern. Now here's a blank placemat and large colored shapes, what I'd like you to do is to duplicate or copy this pattern on your placemat and make sure they look the same. Um, when it's finished, I take a picture of it because then um, I, it, it really makes it easier to score when I go back to do my documentation. I will mention too that the Allen Cognitive Leather Lacing and the Allen Diagnostic Module should correlate to the same level. So what am I talking about levels here? So um, the Allen levels are specific numbered scores, um, which we get from doing assessments. And that number, um, when I look it up, that number shows exactly what the person's abilities are at that cognitive level. So it gives really good information. The, um, the Allen also correlates with the GDS or Global Deter Deterioration Scale, which um, people who work in psychology may be more familiar with. So some other ways that we do assessments are skilled interventions during self-care. 
So this would be really observing someone during their activities of daily living. And I'll give the example, um, which I love, is brushing teeth. So say someone's, um, we're get, we go into the bathroom, I set them up with their toothbrush and toothpaste, and I'll start with verbal cues and say, brush your teeth. If nothing happens, then I move on to visual cues. So I'll set up, I'll put the toothpaste on the toothbrush and say, brush your teeth. If nothing happens, then I move on to tactile cues. I'll put the toothbrush with the toothpaste in their hand and guide them tactily to their mouth. Sometimes they'll take over then and brush their teeth. Sometimes I'll see them brush just one side of their mouth. Sometimes I'll see them try to brush their hair with the toothbrush. But this gives really wonderful information of where the person needs cues, okay? Because you can easily look at someone and say, oh, they're dependent on brushing their teeth. They can't do it. But if we take a further look, we can, we can discover, like a detective, really, um, where they need cues and what they can do themselves in order to keep these skills and maximize their function. And finally, on the bottom, it says informal cognitive assessments during therapeutic activity. Okay, so that's another one that we will do. Um, it, it could include therapeutic activity, like doing, um, putting colored clothespins on clothes bars, colored rings on a rainbow arc. So these are common. If you've seen these, you, you know, that's, that's OT. They're very common modalities, um, as well as through a puzzle. For example, Melissa and Doug has really wonderful wooden puzzles. I think they're also used in pediatrics as well. And there are similarities, we will get to that. So um, it will be to um, you know, duplicate a pattern, whether it on, on a template, like a butterfly, or to duplicate in a vertical plane, you know, give them pictures of colored shapes, blue, square, yellow, circle, and have them duplicate it. So with all that information, uh, next slide, please. With all that information, the occupational therapists are able to find the just right challenge. And we're able to find um, within a week to two weeks time period where this person is currently with their cognition. So as you see on this page, hopefully you can see, it's called a cognitive training guide. And this is what the OTs um, will create, again, after a week to two weeks of working with that person. And it shows where their current um, cognitive level is. And we list here too, um, their matching functional abilities. So it's very easy to look at someone and say what they can't do, but it takes more research and time to find what can they do. And that's what we wanna work with. So this list, you know, first it has an introduction to the Allen levels and what that means. And then it has the patient's abilities, the person's abilities, suggested activities, and learning strategies at their specific cognitive level. And we will share this with um, predominantly families um, through email or when they come to visit, which fortunately now we have visitors back at the hospital. It's, it's awesome. It makes such a difference to have families come in. And we'll also share it with um, staff um, caregivers, staff as they're open um, to learning about it. Because um, it, it is, I'm telling you, it's a real eye opener. Next slide, please. Okay, so getting to into more of the mental health here. Some interesting facts I found on people with dementia. Um, depression is more common in people with vascular dementia. Um, because they're more aware of their condition, as well as Parkinson's disease dementia. Um, depression 
can be diagnosed in any stage of dementia. It can also wax and wane. Someone may start with dementia and then as they, you know, go from mild to moderate to severe dementia, it may disappear. They may not have it anymore. Um, people with dementia may be worried about, you know, memory and future, especially in their mild stages of dementia. In general, older people with depression, as compared with younger, may have more agitation, um, anxiety, and physical symptoms like aches and pains, chronic pain. Anxiety, I found, is more common in people with vascular or frontotemporal dementia, much more than Alzheimer's disease. And by the way, um, getting into um, the next slides, I found the, the most research I did, um, I found information on, on Alzheimer's disease. Next slide, please. Some facts about depression and dementia. Depression is very common um, in the early and middle stages of Alzheimer's disease. Experts say at least 40% of people with Alzheimer's also suffer from depression. So this is huge. Um, identifying depression in someone with Alzheimer's may be difficult and challenging because some of the symptoms um, of dementia can also um, come from, um, you know, um, depression. People with Alzheimer's disease have a reduced level of the stress hormone, um, corticotrophin releasing factor, CRF, which is very interesting. They have less of that stress hormone. Next slide, please. So some common symptoms of both depression and dementia, apathy, you know, lack of caring, loss of interest in activities and hobbies, social withdrawal, which could lead to isolation, trouble concentrating. And oftentimes when, you know, over the years I do individual therapy as well as group therapy, I've had a number of people say with depression, say that they are worried that they're, um, they're losing their memory and that, it, that they have dementia because it's the same symptom. <coughs> Impaired thinking. <coughs> Excuse me. Cognitive impairments experienced by people with Alzheimer's disease often makes it difficult for them to articulate their emotions when they're feeling sad, hopeless, guilty, and other common symptoms of depression. Next slide, please. <coughs> Some differences between depression and dementia. So depression develops much quicker than dementia over a week or a month time period. People with dementia may have language difficulties or orientation, and this rarely occurs in people with depression. Someone with depression may not recall something, but when they are prompted to remember, they will. People with dementia most likely will not remember when prompted. Depression may be less severe in people with dementia, so that's hopeful. Um, and the person with Alzheimer's may be less likely to talk about or attempt suicide. Okay, that takes more brain power. Uh, next slide. So diagnosing depression in people with dementia, um, for those mental health professionals out there, you're familiar with um, how mental illness is diagnosed in someone cognitively intact. You know, the psychiatrist will look for two main symptoms, sadness occurring for two weeks or more pretty consistently and that loss of pleasure in once enjoyable activities called anhedonia, and then any five symptoms from a list. Well, similarly with dementia, the psychiatrist will look for um, the sadness and the loss of pleasure, and then two symptoms from this list. So not five, just two. Um, and the list includes social isolation or withdrawal, 
disruption in appetite that's not related to another medical condition, as well as disruption in sleep, agitation or slowed behavior, irritability, fatigue or loss of energy, feelings of worthlessness or hopelessness, um, or inappropriate or excessive guilt, and recurrent thoughts of death, suicide plans, or a suicide attempt. Okay, so just to note here, it's a lot more observation where someone with dementia may not be able to express their emotions pending on the stage. Um, they still, um, it, it's, it's really um, important for those around them to observe and notice those nonverbal communication skills. Next slide. Okay. Treating depression in people with dementia. So the most common treatment for depression in Alzheimer's disease are starting with medication, SSRIs, um, because there's a lower risk than some other antidepressants of causing interactions with other medications. And so often someone, you know, older adults are on um, several medications. Counseling, gradual reconnection to activities and people that bring happiness. Simply telling the person um, with Alzheimer's to cheer up or snap out of it won't work, just like it doesn't work with people who are cognitively intact. Depression doesn't get treated that way. Um, depressed people with or without Alzheimer's are rarely able to make themselves better by sheer will or without lots of support, reassurance, and professional help. Next slide. Okay, some strategies for treating depression in people with dementia. Okay, so honestly, this slide is smaller. I'm trying to see it. Um, so, you know, it, it mentions support groups, very important. Um, also, we wanna take a look at um, whether the person is up for a support group or more individual therapy, um, depending on how their attention span is and what they're able to understand at their cognitive level. Um, so to follow a schedule, a daily routine schedule is really important. It can be very helpful. Uh, I once had a patient named Rick his wife brought in a 20 page schedule, which I posted in his room and in his, in his medical chart. And it said every day of the week, hour by hour, what he does. And we really tried as much as we could to keep that routine, okay. Um, as for some others, so there is, um, okay. Looking at um, the situation, I'm sorry, I can't <laughs> see this so well. Um, you know, some other strategies, they are listed there. And we want to, um, you know, nurture the person, um, you know, help them through um, doing activities that they can relate to and um, reassure the person. And we're going to move on to the next slide. Don't forget exercise. Some causes of aggression in people with dementia. Physical discomfort um, happens often and the person may not be able to express their pain or their discomfort and it comes out through aggression. So by the way, the next couple slides are going to be specifically on aggression in people with dementia. Um, some common reasons of physical discomfort are urinary tract infections. That's a very common reason for people to come in our units and it causes confusion besides um, the physical discomfort. Decreased ability to verbalize their discomfort, thereby expressing it through physical aggression and actions. Um, it may be due to inadequate rest or sleep the person may be hungry or thirsty, and depending what stage of dementia they're from, they may not be able to tell anyone. They may not be able to um, notice it themselves. 
Medications can cause side effects, especially when taking medication for several health conditions. So that's another good reason to come to a specific um, brain health unit because we have, uh, we have geriatric doctors and they will really work on the medication management. Um, environmental factors can cause aggression and poor communication. And we're gonna talk about those two specific ones next in the next slide. So environmental factors, overstimulation, loud noises, an overactive environment, physical clutter, large crowds, or being surrounded by unfamiliar people can cause anyone discomfort, but someone with dementia really um, the aggression may come out because it's a confusing world with all of those distractions and it makes them feel lost. Um, also a lack of control. Poor communication. Okay, this is actually looking at not the person with dementia, but the people involved in their lives and some poor communication um, through them. So some things we wanna take a look at when we're speaking and communicating with people with dementia is are your instructions simple and easy to understand? We wanna use simple, clear, concise language no extra words because that makes it more confusing. Are you asking too many questions or making too many statements at once? Too much information. Is the person picking up on your own stress or irritability? Um, and we'll talk about more, but sometimes it's not really what you're saying, it's how you're saying it, which comes through with, with, the, uh, with your message. Next slide, please. Management of aggression. So try to identify the immediate cause. Um, think about what happened right before. You know, what triggered that behavior and that emotion? What happened? Rule out pain as the cause of the behavior. Focus on feelings, not facts. Look for the feelings behind the words or actions. Okay, sometimes someone may be saying, ah, ah, ah. And we have no idea what that means, but we can look at the emotions and then work with that. Um, don't get upset, because that just makes it worse. Be positive and reassuring. And what, you know, really, it's not necessarily written on the slide, but what really comes to my mind is respect, right? These are older people. They've, um, they've lived these tremendous lives tons of experiences. And when we respect them, they know it, they feel it. And that's, you know, even if they don't understand what's happening in the world, they still have their emotions. They're still human. They still have feelings. And that's what we can work with. Um, limit distractions. Examine the person's surroundings and adapt them to avoid similar situations. Try a relaxing activity, music, massage, or exercise can be coming. And you'll see that we'll, I'm going to mention exercise in some more slides um, more specifically. I do want to mention too, television is actually distracting. Once someone gets to a moderate and definitely severe stage of dementia, a television becomes just... Um, noisy sound and distracting lights. So really what's better is music. Next slide. Some more ways to manage aggression. Shift the focus to another activity. Oftentimes someone's upset with something, you bring something else, changing, distracting, and they'll forget what they're upset about. So sometimes that works. Take a break. Um, if the person is in a safe environment, environment, then you as the professional, as the family member, as the caregiver, walk away, take a moment for yourself. That's important. Ensure safety at all times. Make sure you and the person are safe. If the person is unable to calm down, call 911. 
tell them this is a person with dementia so they know. Or call the 24-hour helpline, which is listed there, 800-272-3900. Um, the Alzheimer's Association has this 24-hour helpline. And they also have here, share your, you can share your experience with other people on Al's Connected. It's a 24-hour online support community and message board through the Alzheimer's Association. Next slide. Now we're moving on to agitation. Um, it's interesting when I was researching anxiety, it came up more with the word agitation. So we'll go with that, it's more general. The person with dementia is biologically experiencing a profound loss of their ability to negotiate new information and stimulus, basically their environment. Situations that may lead to agitation may include moving to a new residence or nursing home, new environment, changes in their own environment, such as travel, um, hospitalization, or the presence of house guests, who are these people in our house, and that can lead to paranoia. Changes in caregiver arrangements, you know, a different caregiver, or a different time. Misperceived threats, just not understanding and taking it as a threat. Um, fear, fatigue, resulting from trying to make sense out of the confusing world. Next slide, please. So how do we manage agitation in people with dementia? So again, we want to create a calm environment, remove as much many of the stressors as we can. This may involve moving the person to a safer or quieter place, um, offering a security object. You know, um, several of our patients over the years have had stuffed animals, which actually look lifelike. Some of them you can even press on a button and like the stuffed animal cat will meow. Pretty, pretty cool. Um, baby dolls. There are some very lifelike, real looking baby dolls. Um, and I've seen them in, in different colors for different ethnicity. Um, we had one lady on the unit who would actually um, change her baby doll. She'd put the diaper on and she would rock the baby doll. She even fed the baby doll. Um, one time it was interesting, I saw her with her cup of ice water and a straw and she put the straw in the baby doll's mouth. So realistically a baby at that age probably is not sipping through a straw, but anyway, it was, it, it was, it was nice. And, it sh and to her, it worked. Um, besides comforting things, um, privacy, rest, Try soothing rituals and limit caffeine use. Okay. Avoid environmental triggers, noise, glare. Um, I always ask patients when I come in the room, um, do you want the light on or off? Because to me, I want the light on, but I'm not the one who matters. It's the patient. Um, background distraction, such as having the television on, can act as triggers. Also, people feed into other people's behaviors. If one person on the unit is getting agitated, it's going to affect the other people as well. So we really want to look to everyone. Monitor personal comfort. Check for pain, hunger, thirst. You know, we heard similar things when we were just looking at managing aggression. Constipation. I hear about bowel movements every day. Uh, walking helps with that full bladder when they're holding it in and they don't have the ability to know when they need to go to the bathroom. Um, and that can be painful. So with that, um, what's recommended is getting someone on a toileting schedule. Fatigue, infections, skin irritation. Um, you know, I'll just mention during COVID times, uh, when we had COVID outbreaks, um, that really that added, added to agitation and aggression too. Make sure the room is at a comfortable temperature. Be sensitive to fears, misperceived threats, and frustration with expressing what is wanted when they're having trouble communicating what their needs are because they have needs. It's just hard to 
express them. Simplify tasks and routines, keep things simple. Simple instructions, brush your teeth, wash your face, eat your food. Provide an opportunity to exercise, go for a walk, gardening. Um, we have plants. Um, I can do a whole nother um, seminar on plants and the benefits of people with dementia. But plants are really great because it gives all this um, other sensory input. Put on music, dance. Okay, next slide. More managing agitation. Check yourself. Don't raise your voice. Show alarm or offense. We don't want to scare them um, or corner, crowd, restrain, criticize, ignore. That's neglect. Or argue with the person. Take care not to make sudden movements out of the person's view. So I'll talk about view here. A person with dementia, um, as the stages progress, get to have really what's called tunnel vision. So for example, if you put their breakfast tray in front of them and there's someone sitting across from them with a breakfast tray, oftentimes they'll reach for the other person's breakfast tray because they're seeing in front of them first more than up close. So this is important for when you're approaching someone with dementia, approach them to from in front at a little distance, you know, hi, hi, Sue, hi, Sally. And then look for their reaction. They see you say hi or smile and then approach them rather than approaching too close or on the side and definitely not from back. That is going to scare them. See the doctor. And I'll say too here, um, knowing just from personal experience and a family member with dementia um, pretty recently, having the right doctor is key. And I highly recommend, again, I'm not a doctor, but I highly recommend having a geriatric doctor, a gerontologist, a geriatrician, as well as a geriatric psychologist because these are people who are specifically knowledgeable of geriatric needs. A regular PCP, primary care physician, they'll know some, but this is not their specialty area. And, and you know, you might as well have the best care. Share your own experience with others, again, on Owls Connected, an online support community and message board. Share what response strategies have worked for you and get more ideas from other caregivers. Very good support there. Next slide. More management of agitation. So what you can do, back off and ask permission. Use calm, positive statements. Reassure, slow down, add light if needed. Offer guided choices between two options. Would you like the red or the green? Would you like the eggs or the toast? Okay, and then limit options as well. Focus on pleasant events. Offer simple exercise options. Try to limit stimulation or overstimulation. And I'll mention here too benefits of exercise because we're seeing that coming up over and over again. So we know we, we're pretty familiar with the physical benefits of exercise, right? For strength and muscle and decrease um, joint pain. Then there's the psychological benefits of exercise, um, you know, lessening stress, increasing endorphins, as well as people with depression tend to have low dopamine levels. So when we exercise, it's naturally increasing dopamine and thus lessening sadness and lessening depression. And I'm gonna move on to, to cognitive benefits of exercise. So cognitively, when you're doing repetitive exercises like arm curls, one, two, get to 10. Um, oftentimes OTs, we do three sets of 10, do 10 exercises, take a break, okay? Now, 10 more of the same exercise. See if they remember. They may have what's called muscle memory, um, which also is another way to see and that they're focusing and concentrating. And that's another huge benefit of exercise. Say, may I help you? Do you have time to help me? 
you know, maybe they can help you with something. That would be incredible. Um, you're safe here. Okay, make them feel safe and secure. Everything is under control. Or I'm sorry that you're upset. Um, I will stay with you until you feel better. I will keep you company. Um, there's something called therapeutic use of self with which occupational therapists um, really um, delve into in school and in the field as well. And therapeutic use of self is doing something like holding someone's hand, um, rubbing, you know, massaging their arm. I'll ask patients, um, especially when they're upset, can I, is it okay if I give you a hug? Because that physical contact is so beneficial and really helps them feel safe. And it helps them feel human as well. Listen to their frustration. Find out what may be causing the agitation. Try to understand. And then when they can't express themselves, you know, look for other cues and try to reassure them, even if you don't understand reassuring them can help comfort them. Um, next slide, please. So the next slide is on hallucinations. Um, hallucinations are false perceptions of objects or events involving the senses. False perceptions are caused by changes within the brain that result from Alzheimer's disease, usually in the later stages of the disease. The person may have visual hallucinations, seeing things, auditory hearing things or tactile hallucinations, feeling like something's crawling on their body. Um, here's listed other causes of hallucinations, which may or not be related to dementia, schizophrenia, kidney or bladder infections, dehydration, intense pain, alcohol or drug abuse, eyesight or hearing problems and medications. And I will mention too, oftentimes when people come in the hospital, they don't have their glasses, they don't have their hearing aids, or when they do, they'll say, well, I have glasses, but they don't help me. Or the hearing aid, um, you know, it doesn't really work for them anymore. I have a patient now who is having hallucinations. It's interesting, the family noticed them after the COVID vaccine, and um, some of the family members made an assumption that the vaccine caused hallucinations. Um, I have my doubts with that, but again, I'm not diagnosing. However, once the patient was on the unit and I've done more cognitive um, assessments and as well as the psychiatrist, she does now have a diagnosis of dementia. And she'll be, uh, the other day she was saying, oh, hey kitty, oh, what a cute cat. And, or, or look at that little child, look at that child on the floor. She thought the, Purell um, um, soap dispenser was a telephone. Um, and again, what what I the way I look at this is function. If this person, if the hallucination are disrupting their way of life versus they're still functional. Um, it's interesting, this person too, she is aware that she's having hallucinations and she'll tell people, well, actually yesterday I worked with her. She told someone, yeah, the, the, the COVID, the, the, um, when I had COVID, that caused hallucinations. Um, so that's her perception. Again, the family was saying it was from the vaccine, um, but she does have a diagnosis of dementia. Uh, moving on, antipsychotic medications can be effective in some situations. And that's what this um, lady is on as well. Next screen, please. Implications of mental health on people with dementia. So cognitive change and changes are common among people with mental illness, such as schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. Um, those mental illnesses can also increase people's risk of developing dementia for the following reasons. And I actually got this from Dr. Leah Richman Rackert, an assistant professor in the Department of Psychology at the University of Michigan where she um, found shared genetics um, as well as brain vul vulnerability shows up as mental health prob problems earlier in life often develops into dementia 
later in life. So some things to be aware of. Next slide, please. So how do we help someone with mental health issues and dementia? Okay, when someone has dementia, they need reassurance so they're still valued and that they, they um, know that their feelings matter and that they matter and that they're still alive and cared about. Freedom from as much external stress as possible. We really wanna limit the stress as much as we, we can. Um, appropriate activities and stimulation to help them remain alert and motivated for as long as possible. And that's where those cognitive assessments I talked about in the beginning really come in handy to find what can this person functionally do, and then we can find the right activities for them. Um, I have a patient I saw yesterday who has severe dementia he has made some improvement. Um, you know, I always, I give credit to the medications. Whereas first he was total assist for feeding. Now he will do finger foods. And what's important to note too is um, in life, as it's the skills that you develop as a baby and a toddler and a young adult, those first skills that you develop are the last skills that you lose. So they're the ones that stay. So even when someone may forget how to dress, they may forget how to walk, feeding is one that stays the longest. So um, as they progress with dementia, they may forget how to use a fork or utensil. Um, I've seen people try to use a straw to eat their scrambled eggs. I can't do that. No, we wanna give them the right utensil. And when they can't use the utensil, finger foods, let them eat with their hands. It's okay. Rather than feeding them, it's still functional. So I was telling you about my patient yesterday. He has, he, now he's up to finger foods and he can feed himself on days when he is awake and functioning. Every day is different. Um, but yesterday too, I took a ball. So someone with the later stages of dementia, they respond well to sensory stimulation. So this could be, um, you know, holding a stuffed animal, listening to music. I have like light up sticks and really funky stuff, honestly. Um, balls with little um, balls inside that make noises and squeeze. And um, a ball, we have large thera balls in the gym that has spikes on it. Um, my patient yesterday, someone else said, oh, that ball has pimples on it, uh, however you describe it. So my patient, Bobby, who wasn't doing a thing, I tried a ball toss with him. Yeah. So he actually, he, when the ball came to him, he pushed it away. It's a reflex. He pushed it. Then I put his hands out tactile cues because verbal and visual didn't work, went to tactile, he was able to catch the ball. And the other people on the unit were saying, yay, Bobby, woo, go Bobby. It was awesome. Um, the opportunity to engage in activities that are meaningful and important to them. I'll mention too, we had a patient once, his wife brought in his tie collection. He has over 200 ties in a box, they're rolled up, and what does he do during the day? He will um, unroll the ties and roll them. This takes some time and he'll do it a couple of times throughout the day. This is meaningful activity for him and it's functional. So it's great. And it will keep him from getting agitated and aggressive. Um, I had another person, his wife, set up, um, he, he worked in construction or with tools, something physical and during his career. And his wife set up their garage as a, as a tool shop. And she bought children's safe tools. And she, every morning she would give him um, a lunch to a brown bag lunch, take along to work. Okay, I did quotes there. And he would say, okay, bye, dear. He'd go into the garage and he would work with whatever tools were there doing things and then take his lunch break. Sometimes his wife joins him for his lunch break. 
But these are really creative, engaging, meaningful activities, keeping the person um, functional and accomplishing something. It's huge. Healthy social yeah. interaction, yeah. relationships with others, improving their yeah. um, appetite, recognizing that it's common to experience depression, anxiety, or apathy. Next slide. Suzanne? Very. Some more strategies for treating people with dementia and mental illness. Introduce yourself, build rapport. It may take more than one day. Use clear and concise language. Approach person from the front. We talked about finding That's a client. And, and, uh, nobody can hear person up at a table or the bathroom for self-care. The environment will give them cues as well. Provide the necessary cues and whether they're intermittent or constant cues. Consider attention span. Oftentimes I'll work with a patient for 10 minutes and then they're done. And then I'll go on to another patient and come back to them later after they've had a rest break. Make certain the person's comfortable. Next slide. Some more strategies, your position of yourself, okay? And is important rather than standing uh -huh. over them. Environmental factors, comfort we mentioned, positive feedback, assure them you respect their intelligence, ask about their past or current um, life interests, orientation, um, cognitive activities according to their right level. Next slide. Some treatment ideas um, listed here, um, and I am speeding up so I get to your questions. Coping skills, exercise, relaxation, a memory book is a good one. Stress management, depression, safety training. Next slide. Additional treatment, positive thinking, spirituality, keeping a journal, even if it's illegible, let them write therapeutic activities um, and that be, can be graded according to their stage of dementia, like playing cards, manual tasks, sensory stimulation we talked about. Next slide. <clears throat> Maximizing treatment and carryover. Keep handouts in a labeled folder with their name on it. They can take it home with them. Review, repetition, may need to repeat and reteach. Train other family members, caregivers. I'm looking at therapy needs. Happy and positive memories, pictures. I once, um, someone was looking for their license. I went online and made them a fake driver's license. They were thrilled until it got lost again. Consider attention span, we talked about. Next slide. And that's my references. Any questions? So I see here are social workers involved in this process. Absolutely. I have social workers I work closely with, especially when I'm doing a home safety assessment. And sometimes they'll too ask me to call the family and explain the results. Um, social workers work on our interdisciplinary team. So, you know, once a week we have our interdisciplinary plan of care. Okay, so yeah, we work so um, very closely with social workers. Even their office is right next to the rehab gym. Any other questions? Knowing that dementia runs in the family, what precautions can you take now? Oh, I love these questions. Um, so as for if dementia runs in your family, you know, there is, there's genetic testing. 
I would talk with your doctor. I would talk with their doctor. And one thing that's really recommended, I mean, I could go on forever, but there's a study you can look up called the Nun Study. And what we learned from this is these were older nuns who um, did not develop dementia because what were they doing, right? They were learning new information and they were doing things actively. They're dancing, cleaning. Um, when you go to lectures, you're learning new information. So oftentimes you'll see someone working on word searches or crossword puzzles. That's good and all, but that's working with their already, their, their knowledge they already have. And what's key is learning something new. And you can learn something new at any age. Uh, I see a question. How about assessments? What's the question? But someone's sister does crossword puzzles every day. Excellent. So does my mother. Sudoku, word scrambles. Um, really learn something new. They say learn a new language, learn a new skill. Think of what is something, especially when you have more time when you're retired, what is something I want to learn? Learn something new. Go to lectures. That's key. Um, also, you know, you may want to look into testing to see what's there. The Alzheimer's Association um, is an excellent um, organization. You go on the website, you learn a lot of information and people there too to ask questions. And, you know, feel free to email or reach out to me as well. Okay. Thank you, everyone.